Time Chroniclers, New Beginnings, Part 1. Date, 18 September, 1831. Worst night of my life. Hi, boy, are you awake? Why do you got your back to us? Can't you see? He fell asleep that way. I thought I saw his arm move. He's out cold. It's probably just the shadows from the fire. It all started on my birthday. Poor tired boy. Not a way to spend your 15th birthday. You cannot control the weather. Your father and I are proud of you. You worked hard today. We had to prepare the farm. <laughs> Did you see what I've prepared? Mutton chops? Yes, Jimmy. For my favourite son. Your only son. What are those? <laughs> those are presents. For me? <laughs> Wondering when you'd notice them. I suppose you should wait till after dinner. But I cannot wait any longer. Here. It has a family symbol on it. Yes. Your father had it engraved right onto the cover. It's the most beautiful journal. It's like father's. And a pencil tucked away on the inside. But don't forget this one. It's a Bible. But Mom, how can we afford it? With all your father's hard work around here, and yours, everything is starting to turn around for us a bit. We have a steady income from the cows, and the crops are ready for harvest. Thank you, Mum. Oh, it's the most precious thing I could give you. Can I show it to Father? You can. And tell him it's time to come in for supper. I won't have any of your back talk now. Talking to cows. If anyone ever heard... Father! Father! Jimmy! Come to work alongside me some more, eh? <laughs> a right glutton for punishment, I'd say. Yes, I'll help. But first, I wanted to show you this. It's stupendous. I saw it before your mother wrapped it up. Looks better in your hands, though. <laughs> Looks like it belongs there. But I've, uh, I've got something for you. Here. Should I wait and open it with Mum? Probably. Oh. <laughs> Why not now? I've never been much for waiting. <laughs> Mum said the same thing. You two are two peas in a pod. You're 15 now, right? Yeah. I don't understand. You're giving this to me, now? It was meant to be passed on to you. And this being your 15th, I believe it's rightfully fitting. But Father, it's your gold watch. You always wear it. I can't imagine you without it. Jimmy, this watch is more than just a timepiece. It's a symbol for what you need to do. It's your time now. You've got a keen mind and an art for the things of God. And it's a doing art, not just an hearing. Your mum always tells of the time when you went to go get the doctor for me, through the rain, when I was so sick with the cholera. Rode all night, you did. God was watching over me, and you. I know. He always is, son. And you've been writing your history like your mum told you? I have. And that history shows God's plan. He always has a plan. Do you hear that? Sounds like a bunch of horses. Clark, I'll get this side of the barn. You like the other. But what if someone's in there? It'll send him a clear message. Now get moving. Father, what's happening? Shh. It's the barn. It's on fire. Open the doors wide. Then grab Daisy. I'll get the horses. Come on, Daisy. Come on, Essie. Let's go. It's all right, Essie. Easy, girl. Easy. Down. Down, Essie. Oh. Oh. 
Charlie, <coughs> you too, Essie. <coughs> Hold on, I got you. I'm going to get out of here. <coughs> good, a good boy, Jimmy. Watch out! <coughs> Almost out. <coughs> Wait, I've got one more thing <coughs> to give you, Father. You're going to be fine. Son, this, this is for you. Your journal? Keep it with the others. Oh, son, I love you. Father, I, I need you. I'm not ready for you to. Well, what have we here? Wait, who are you? I told you there was someone in there. Mr. Stewart just sent us in for the barn. He didn't say to hurt Don't you. be wagging your gums. How long have you been there, boy? You killed my father! What we gotta do is one. He's seen too much, and perhaps heard more. But what about my father? He didn't look like he'll need anything but six stout blokes and a shovel. <laughs> Mr. Stewart, is that who told you to do this? Put the sack over his head and throw him on me off. Why? Calling. Okay, I'll get it. <sighs> Scott? I'll get it. Oh, never mind. Scott, we slept in! It's 1020, get up! I'll catch it tonight. Scott, our church doesn't have a Sunday evening service. Then we can do TV church again. You know, you make your famous pancakes and we all watch together. Honey, we did that last week. It's gotten so we don't know anyone at church anymore. I know that family we sit behind. You know, the one with the manly aftershave, cold spice or something. What's his name? Ted? Tom? I know it starts with a T. Suzanne, that's the beauty of going to a big church. We hear the message, but at this season in our lives when we don't have time, we don't have to get involved. People are starting to think we're visitors. They do not. It starts at 11.30. 11. Okay. So it's 10.25 now. It's a 25-minute drive. That's... 10 minutes! You round up the girls. I'll get heat. All right, men and family, we are on ride alert. Wake, Wake up. up. We are 10, ten minutes departing party for church. church. Dad is pulling out in, in 10 minutes. Is someone starting a race? Hope it's the bullhorn mom got for his soccer game. Rise and shine, girls. Let's get up and put on our Sunday clothes as fast as you can. We have to leave for church in nine minutes and 40 seconds. Got that part. All my clothes are wrinkled. Can't we have TV church again? Nope, but nice try. Hope, mom said to get up. Okay, I heard. Winnie, I'll be the mom. Hope, I said to get up. I can't find my shoes. Do your best, girls. Heath, my man, already up and dressed. Look at you. Uh, well... Okay, time to turn off that video game and get ready for church. Heath? Huh? This isn't just a game. It's pack pong and I'm almost at level 617. See? Great. Okay, we need to be in the car in seven minutes! So you need to jump up and stick on your shoes. Heath... Okay, I'm just finishing up the... Let me help you out here. 
Excuse me? Dad, what are you doing? Game over! But it wasn't saved! Sorry, bud. See you in the car in six minutes and 30 seconds! Suzanne, let's go! Everybody have your breakfast? Yeah. You mean these cocoa crunchies in a cup? That's fast food. Suzanne, can you hold mine just until I pull out? Sure. Oh, and it doesn't fit in the cup holder. Heath, weren't you wearing that yesterday? Maybe. I do smell last night's fajita dinner on it. (laughs) Only my wife can simultaneously hold two cups of cereal and put on makeup with the car going 65 miles an hour. I'm multitasking. At least I'm not driving. This time. Has anyone seen a brush? I saw one by my feet. Here. Uh, Winnie, you might want to look at your shoe. Ugh. Dad, I'm sorry, but we have to turn around. I'm wearing the wrong shoes. Oh, that's okay, Winnie. I'm sure they go just fine. Okay, I'll take that cereal now, Suzanne. No, I mean they're two different shoes. Well, lucky for you, we're going to church, where everyone is friendly and kind. Winnie, we can't go back. People won't notice. Besides, we don't go to church to make the best impression. Hold on, everyone! Uh, Did you see that? That guy cut right in front of me. Thank the Lord we're alive. Mom, did you know you have a black line all the way across your face? Mm Mm-hmm. You were saying, Mom? We don't go to church to make a good impression. We go to worship the Lord together. Well, we're here. Guess I picked a bad day to wear white, eh? With the cocoa crunchies, it kind of looks like polka dots. Let's hope the greeters have already sat down. No such luck. There's one greeter holdout. Scott. Good morning. Oh, looks like a tough one. Well, we're glad you're here. And here's a visitor's pack. We're not visitors. We go here. Recently? Yes. Okay, let's just sit down near the back. That's where we always sit. Come back soon. Er All right. This weekend, the young married class will have their Why I Said I Do Chili Cook-Off. And the Nifty Fifty class will have a Believer's Bingo Night. Well, before you sit down, turn around and shake hands with someone. Hey, Ted, isn't it? Love the aftershave. It's Garrett. I knew it was a T name. T? At the end. Garrett. Do I know you? I'm Scott. We sit here behind you. Really? Oh, sorry, buddy. So you've met my daughter, Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Hey, Winnie. Love the shoes. I see up Instagram posts. You wouldn't. Say cheesy feet. All right. Everyone be seated, please. Let's begin. Today's lesson is about hypocrisy. Did you know that Jesus was harsher on the people who were supposedly godly than anyone else? He called them whitewashed tombs. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be something they aren't. It's someone who's wearing a mask. Ugh. So, how's our little captain? I believe he's sleeping now. Been a hard day for the bloke. Too bad he was at the wrong place at the right time. And what's a mum gonna do without no son or husband? Now don't be getting all sentimental on me. We did what we had to do. The boy saw us and could have helped his mum identify us. Oh, and it pays pretty well. So, it looks like we're going to coal mine country. We're leaving them a surprise package? No, yes. How's our esteemed editor today? I'd say the Honorable Mr. Reed Braddock is living up to his reputation. You know, deadline looming. Cracking the whip, eh? Enough said. I'll make sure to stay out of his way. Yeah, me too. He's under a lot of pressure. I guess a big lead fell through. 
Oh, that's the newspaper biz, eh? Well, I'm hiding out in my QB. Scott, I need you in here. Pronto. Uh-oh. I guess I'm not. Coming, Mr. Braddock. Good luck. Jared, you need something to do? Because you look kind of lost. Uh, no, just checking my sources. Well, get the... to it. Yes, sir. On it. So, what is it you need, Mr. Braddock? Great view of the city from here, eh, Penner? Very nice. Did you fill in the drop story? Oh, yes. Yes. Luckily, there was a freeway pileup. Saved our bacon. Well, that's good. I, I mean, not good, but, you know, newsworthy and... I've been keeping up with you, Penner. You're good. Your stuff's clean. Never questionable. It comes across as very official. Very, um... Unbiased. Kind of feels scientific-ish. Well, thank you, sir. That's the goal. Well, that's why I'm giving you this opportunity. It's a chance to prove yourself. And if you do, perhaps you could move from that cubicle to a window office with the accompanying benefits. Nice little salary bump. Hey, you have a wife and kids, right? Oh, yeah. That would be great. Well, as it turns out, in a few months, the HMS Beagle is going to dock in San Pedro. The HMS Beagle, sir? Oh, you know, the ship that took Charles Darwin on the voyage around South America. The Galapagos Islands? I'm sorry, sir. I don't know much about it. Well, you will. As it turns out, they've made a replica of this great ship, and now it travels the world, educating people about the latest theories of evolution, climate change, etc. When it docks here in San Pedro, it'll be open to the public. They'll show movies on the sails, do lectures, field trips, and tours for the children. Sounds like it's going to be a huge media circus. Right. And we're going to be one of the sponsors while it's here. Big opportunity for our paper. So we want to get the drop on this. I was thinking of a whole series of articles giving some background on what led up to the events of that fateful voyage of the original Beagle back in 1831. I really don't know where to begin. Here, you can start with this. This is a press kit sent to us by the Beagle Project. I was reading a little on it myself. Wow, there's a lot in here. The original Beagle was launched for the first time in May of 1820. But her first voyage wasn't until six years later. She had been refitted as a survey ship. Under the leadership of Captain Pringle Stokes, the Beagle accompanied the ship HMS Adventure to survey Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. You have been reading. Yes, fascinating stuff. But during the two-year voyage, there were many tragedies. Uh, the captain eventually committed suicide. Well, soon the decision was made that both ships would be taken to Montevideo for much needed repairs. So that wasn't the voyage that Darwin was on? No. After that, a man by the name of Robert Fitzroy was assigned to be captain. It turns out he was only 23 at the time. Under his direction, the ship was rebuilt and retrofitted. He was given the assignment of another survey to South America. And because Fitzroy didn't want his life to end the same way as Captain Stokes, he looked for a companion to accompany him. Charles Darwin. Exactly. Now, there's a wonderful story between these two men. So, in this series of articles, I want you to tell that story. Who was Robert Fitzroy? How was Charles Darwin chosen for the voyage? What scientific enlightenments led Darwin to eventually help shape the modern understanding of evolution? But it will favor evolution. Yes, let's take these stories deep. Whip the public into a frenzy, so when this replica of the HMS Beagle docks in San Pedro, people flock to see it. And if I don't happen to agree with evolution? Well, why wouldn't... Oh. Oh. You're not one of those religious people, are you? I mean, I kind of got the drift you went to church and all, but I didn't realize... Actually, that... I don't know what I really believe about the whole thing. Well, perfect. 
Go and report, and I'm sure it will convince you. And if it doesn't? Oh, well, I'm not going to go there. You're a reporter, a skeptic. It will. And if not, I'm sure Travis can take it on. Travis? Yeah, he's been dying to get into that corner office. No, Mr. Braddock, that office is going to have my name on it. I'll start digging in, and you'll have a great series of articles. I thought you might see it that way. Now, let's get started. Yes, sir. What you doing there, boy? Why are you bringing me here? You'll find out soon enough. <laughs> this is kidnapping, you know. Just shut your lip. Could be a lot worse. Here, have a biscuit. It might be your last. Uh, looks like we're here. I, I don't understand. Well, we took it upon ourselves to give you a new trade. Yeah, coal mining. Why? Where else do you dump a kid who's seen too much? <laughs> You're lucky to be alive. You'll never get away with this. Watch us. What can I do for you? We have a boy who's ready to work. But... Tom! Yes, sir? Show the boy to the foreman. Horace! We got a new boy for ya! So a new worker for the mine, eh? Well, I guess you'll be expecting the usual pay. Not a penny less. You an orphan? No, sir. Those men, they, they took me and killed my father and burnt my farm. Oh, they did, did they? That's awful. We've got to contact the authorities. Oh, that would be wonderful, sir. I know my mum is very worried. Except that, well, the only authority around here is me. What? And I say, get to work. Why? We need a hurrier. Tom, you be the pusher. Follow me. I'll show you how to get started. <coughs> my name's Tom. I'm Jimmy. Been working in these coal mines for a long time. No way, way around pretty well. <coughs> I've been pushing these cots full of coal. You'll pull, I'll push. All right. Whoa, the ceiling gets pretty low here. I'm almost crawling. Don't we have any lights? You have to buy your own candles and I don't have any money. At least we're near to the top than some. Here's a spot. Ow! You okay? <coughs> Yeah, I'm fine. You need to run your hand above your head, like this. As my eyes adjusted to the coal mine, I shivered. It seemed to be a dark and damp place of eternal night. The men who worked in it looked more like creatures than people, with their blackened bodies, their raspy throats, and their humped backs. I couldn't imagine anyone working here for more than a few days, much less years. But this, it seemed, was my destiny. Not for long, if I could help it. Guys, I'm home! Yay! Wow, dinner at home. What a nice surprise. <laughs> yeah, you told me you had good news. Winnie, can you carry the food over? Sure. Honey, our ship just might have come in. And it's called the HMS Beagle. Really? What's going on? I just got a new assignment. And if I do well, Braddock promised me a raise. Yay, a new cell phone! Back phone too, here I come! A leaf blower! A, a leaf, leaf blower. blower? Well, it's good to hear someone around here is taking chores seriously. Wait, what? I want to make it into a hovercraft. Oh. I'm afraid we're going to have to pay down our credit cards. I'm starting to be afraid to answer the phone. <sighs> okay, who would like to pray for our meal? Anyone? Not, Not it. it. Okay, I'll catch it again. Dear Lord, thank you for this food and bless it to our bodies. Amen. 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 What does that mean anyway, bless it to our bodies? It's praying that the food will be good for us. We're asking to bless greasy tacos and tortilla chips covered in nacho cheese to our bodies? <laughs> yeah, I guess we really are praying for a miracle on that one. So, tell us what you're writing about. It's called the HMS Beagle Project. It's about evolution. Oh yeah, I've been studying that in school. You, you have? have? Winnie, are they teaching things that go against what we learn in church? Yeah, kinda. I don't know if I like that. Well, I've already done some research, so time for a Penner Family Pop Quiz. Uh. 
Who was the one that invented the theory of evolution? Everyone knows that. Charles Darwin. That's what I thought too, but the idea was around long before Charles. Really? Yeah, ancient Greeks, Romans, Chinese, and others suggested that animals could change from one to another. Really, Dad? Yeah, but things really didn't get started until the 1700s. At that time, most people believed God had made animals with a fixity, that they couldn't change. They believed Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Here, I've got it on my phone. And God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Boy, with all those after their kind, it's no wonder they thought animals couldn't change. Yeah, the Bible seems pretty clear about it. So, while animals do only reproduce after their kind, it seems like God must have also built in the ability to adapt and vary within those kinds. Exactly. Anyway, in the 1700s, a new movement began. If I remember my history, all of this was taking place during the Age of Enlightenment. Oh yeah, we were studying that in world history. My teacher taught us that it was the period in France where mankind was supposedly throwing off superstitious thinking in exchange for reason. Well, there may be some good things that came out of it. It was a period where people began to trust man's ideas instead of God's word. Anyway, a French mathematician and scientist by the name of Comte de Buffon published a series of books called Histoire Naturelle, starting in 1749. In these books, he was very clear that animals could change. In what way? Well, he saw that different regions had distinctly different animals and plants from others. He also believed that species of animals could improve and degenerate. He even suggested that all land-dwelling animals had come from 38 original animals. And I guess his ideas set the stage for many others to come after him. So, Dad, how does this all fit with what we're learning in church? I'm not really sure, Winnie. I guess I've always been raised to trust the Bible, but I'm looking forward to what else I can dig up on this project. Scott, I think you need to be careful what you research. I'll be fine. Okay, someone pass some more taco shells. Who is it? Saint Stewart. Yes, please enter. I see you're brewing another batch of your special elixirs, Professor Thaddeus Copernicus. I've told you just to call me Darby. But I'm trying to help you maintain this grand delusion you've created. Why do you mock the very hand that feeds you? And quite lavishly, I must admit. Yes, things have exceeded expectations in such an astonishing way. Since King Henry III granted us patent, I believe that we will be able to increase our network of salesmen by tenfold. I wanted to report to you that at the time of last count, we now have 127 representatives traveling England, peddling the very elixir before us. Stuart, I believe we are to be rich beyond our wildest dreams. I commend you for your work in finding so many irreputable distributors, upon whose backs we will build our fortune. Speaking of that, as I gain new recruits, shall we modify our pitch? No, I think we stick with our message. Since his recent demise, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's ideas continue to become more popular. While his theories are considered radical in many circles, they do serve our purpose. You believe the motion of fluids etching canals between human tissue can cause the evolution of new organs? Is it true, Darby? Do you believe humans are transmuting? Be it true or not is not really material to us. What is germane is that Lamarck has put that question into the minds of many. And that Dr. Thaddeus Copernicus's Lamarckian fluids will regenerate these organs, providing good overall health, a curing of various sundry ailments, and promoting positive organ transmutation. The psychology of it all is amazing to me. Many people don't even understand Lamarck's proposal of animal transmutation, and how it stands in contradiction to the very Bible they love. Yet when you plant the possible chance of organ transmutation into their minds, even the staunchest religious man will grasp its straws to do anything to grant himself better health. Like it's a shot at immortality. And they will pay greatly for it. Yes, all that stands in our way would be those that 
discredit Lamarck and his work. Speaking of which, what has been done to shut up that little man Oliver? Clive and Marley took care of him right well. The grave should be silent, and his son was sold into slavery to the coal mines. Excellent work, Stuart. And they're bringing his research, correct? Research? Yes. All the evidence he's gathered against Lamar. Against you. We need to make sure no one finds that. I'll have Marley and Clive go back to the farm and find it. What if the wife knows of his work? Or recognizes them? Then, she must be silenced. Will Jimmy ever make it back to his mother? Will Stuart and Darby hurt Jimmy's mother? To find out, join us for part two of Time Chroniclers New Beginnings. Time Chroniclers is a production of Creation Quest. While the story and characters are fictitious, they are based on real historical and scientific facts. To learn more about this series or for more tools to learn the scientific evidence for creation, please come to timechroniclers.com. That's timechroniclers.com. Our special thanks to our cast in order of appearance. Jimmy was played by Jaden Berthoff. Marley was voiced by Chris Heckman and Clive by Ethan Heckman. Marion was brought to life by April Ely, and Oliver by Dwayne Riffenberg. The part of Suzanne was voiced by Sandy Roy. Scott by Rick Carhart. Hope by Melody Roy. Winnie by Summer Roy. And Heath by Ruben Edisham. The church greeter was Pat Roy, and the pastor was portrayed by Jerry Zordell. The part of Garrett was voiced by Ray Edisham, and the part of Sarah by Carrie Tarter. Jared and Horace were both played by Harold Tarter. Mr. Braddock was played by David Gislon, and the mine owner by Andrew Riffenberg. The voice of Tom was Joshua Yoon. Darby was portrayed by Glenn Haskell, and Mr. Stewart by Clayton Timmer. Today's episode was written by Sandy, Pat, Summer, and Melody Roy. Our cast director was Sandy Roy. Josiah Persinger was our dialogue editor, and Pat Roy did the sound design. Original music was composed by Connor Savoca. The actors were recorded at Calvary Baptist Church in Paradise, California. And I'm Frank Montenegro, asking you to make sure to join us next time as Tom and Jimmy try to find a way to escape from the coal mines in Time Chroniclers New Beginnings, Part 2.